everyone. Welcome back to SALT Talks. My name is John Darcy. I'm the Managing Director of SALT, which is a global thought leadership forum at the intersection of finance, technology, and geopolitics. We've been doing these SALT Talks, which is a series of digital interviews with leading investors, creators, and thinkers uh, during the work-from-home period in lieu of our global conference series. And just like we like to do at our SALT conferences, uh, the goal with these SALT Talks is to provide our audience a window into the minds of subject matter experts and provide a platform for big, important ideas that we think are shaping the future um, of the world. Uh, today, we're very excited to welcome Jerry Pascucci to SALT Talks. Uh, Jerry is the Managing Director of UBS Financial Services, and he serves as the Head of Alternative Investments uh, for UBS Wealth Management Americas, uh, where he is responsible for research, development, approval, and distribution of all alternative investment products, including hedge funds, managed futures, real estate, and private equity offerings. He's the president and a director of the firm's commodity pool operator, as well as other registered investment advisor entities. Uh, his responsibilities include the oversight of product origination, manager selection, investment, and operational due diligence, portfolio construction, and distribution of all alternative offerings in the United States region. Uh, prior to joining UBS in 2010, Jerry served in various capacities at Citigroup Global Markets and related entities uh, in various capacities since 1996. He began at Citigroup Global Markets as a senior credit risk officer, focused primarily on market and counterparty risks associated with hedge fund and commodity pool and clients. He rose to managing director of Citigroup Alternative Investments prior to uh, joining UBS. And Citigroup Alternative Investments is a division of Citigroup that administered its hedge fund, fund of hedge fund, and commodity pool businesses of which uh, the Skybridge investment team was formerly a part. And I know Jerry and, and Anthony will likely get into that during the interview. Uh, just a reminder, if you have any interviews, uh, any questions, excuse me, for Jerry during the conversation, uh, you can enter them in the Q&A box at the bottom of your video screen. And I'm going to turn it over uh, to Anthony Scaramucci, who is the founder and managing partner of Skybridge Capital, as well as the chairman of SALT, uh, to conduct the interview with Jerry. John, thanks very much. And before I get over to Jerry, I just want to thank you for putting my grandfather up on the wall behind you. It was very appropriate for this because Jerry's grandfather, as he knows, looks very similar to my grandfather's. So Almost both, the same. Yeah, yeah. We're both very happy that you put For all you of put, our, our recurring you, salt you talk listeners, up there. The, the constant yeah. ridicule has led me to continue to change up my background. And hopefully yeah. one day I'll find well, a background well, that I appreciate, is suitable for Anthony. I appreciate the lineage. Jer Jerry and I certainly do. And so... Uh, but Jer, go back further than John's introduction. So where'd you grow up? I know you live out on Long Island here with me. And so tell us a little bit about your upbringing, if yeah. you don't mind. Okay. And and before I do, thanks for having me, Anthony. Great to be with, with everyone. And I'm, I'm happy to be part of such a distinguished group of guests in terms of the folks that you've had here. Uh, the next five minutes probably won't suggest I'm in that category, but I'll, I'll try anyway. Um, so uh, I live pretty close to where I, I grew up. Um, you know, my parents were from the outer boroughs. Uh, I grew up in Long Island. My dad was a civil servant. My mom was a homemaker. Uh, I actually got picked up from an adoption agency, Stairs, about a week before, I think in 1969, when I was born. If you got to 10 months, you went into the foster care program. And I got adopted by a middle class family at nine and a half. So when you think about life, and uh, how a couple of days or minutes could take a drastic turn. I doubt I'd be sitting here talking to you if that, if that stint uh, in the orphanage lasted an extra two weeks. So uh, you could always come back to that, right? Hey, well, well, amen. And so uh, how many brothers and sisters did you grow up with, Jerry? I have one, I have one younger brother. And so you, your parents ended up adopting him as well, or they had him? Yeah, actually, they did. I, I, I was a public method, and by the time my brother came along five years later, you know, they were able to do it privately. So it was a different experience uh, with my brother. He's he's uh, he's blonde hair, blue-eyed, fair-skinned, and my dad used to like to say he was from the north. Hey, Darcy, stop smiling, okay? <laughs> Look at Darcy over there. You see him in the Zoom smiling away? Look I do, over. I do. Yeah, I got you, hazel you, eyes. You, you never... You never met people like Dorsey, you and me growing up. We never <laughs> met people like him. It took us to get to these investment banks, Jerry. Okay, but but let's talk about, I want to go back to the first day I met you. Remember when I brought the Italian food I into uh, I 59th remember. Street? Yeah. And uh, we were buying the Citibank Alternative Investment Management thing. You were staying at City temporarily. 
Yeah. Uh, take us take us through the decision to get over to UBS and uh, how yeah. far you go back with Ray and uh, Troy. Yeah. That's, <laughs> so, you know, the decision about going to UBS. So, well, let me back up. So we, we shared the floor. It was an interesting time because after the Smith Barney merger with Morgan Stanley, we had people working at different firms sitting on the same floor, which is a, which was a weird, which is a weird thing. I was in the JV for nine months. I thought I'd be in the JV for nine minutes, but um, at the time, Ray and I were partners. Ray was running the business. I was running the portfolios for both the macro and commodity pools that were legacy businesses and the fund of hedge funds that was a legacy business, which if, which back in, oh, I guess it was 95, we were starting to reboot or 2005. I don't even know what decade it is anymore, but it was a long time ago. And so we were running our businesses together the fund of funds was going into the JV. Um, I'm sorry, the, the commodity pool businesses and some of the other ancillary businesses were going into the JV. The fund of funds was not. So there was a period of time where everyone sort of sat on the floor but had different business cards. Leading up to that, um, the investment team had reported to me. Uh, and so I was very involved in what that book looked like uh, on a day to day basis. Troy at the time was a new hire who I had interviewed. Um, and that's another story unto itself, but we've only got 45 minutes. That was interesting. <laughs> but clearly I knew then that he had opinions and he had viewpoints and, uh, and that he did his homework. He's very large binder of, um, of, of very neatly uh, um, wrapped pages of analysis told me that right away. Um, and so he joined the team early on that I was managing and, you know, off we went. And by design, I think even back then, uh, and this is a long time ago, you know, we were looking for um, a concentrated portfolio. Uh, we were looking to have forward looking views all the time. That was going to be the hallmark of what we did. We weren't trying to compete for what was at the time a business that tended to have 40, 50, 60 names in a portfolio. You know, we just thought, um, that kind of commod that kind of product was already commoditized then in some respects and inside the type of distribution system we were in it wasn't all that relevant or valuable so we, we really set out to do something different um, and Troy was his viewpoints obviously became one of the largest and ultimately the largest you know influencer into the shape that that would take so um, you know, it was a differentiated business from Go. It kind of lived in between the single manager business and the multi-manager business. And that's exactly where we intended to situate it. And I think it, it proved to be a very useful tool for families, you know, way back then even. Well, and I, you know, and I appreciate that. And I think it's a, re it's a really good narrative for where we are right now, because I think, you know, that was one of your remarks after March. You were like, okay, well, in the context of its performance, designed the way it was, it sort of acted exactly the way you thought. So, uh, yeah. uh, and I think that's a pretty good tie in back to that narrative. So, so now you're, you're over at UBS, you're, 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 you're meeting my good friend, Brian Hall over there. You're yeah. working over there with him yeah. and you're building this asset, this alternative asset management platform. Yeah. So tell us a little bit about that. Tell us a little bit about what the things yeah. you've been looking for over there. <laughs> So, um, look, we started from scratch there. When I got there, you know, it's just after the crisis, we wanted to invest. Um, it was past the point where, you know, people started to become a little bit braver. I didn't get there until, you know, 2010. Um, that was good because they hadn't done a product in about 18 months, and I didn't really have a lot of demo to do. So there's nothing to tear down, and you could start to build right away, and that puts you in a position to get going. Um, my thought there, you know, when I left the, the Morgan Stanley JV, I swore I'd never even have a checking account again, nonetheless work for another bank. But I did have a tremendous opportunity going to work for some of the people you mentioned, Bob McCann, John Brown, who I was his first hire there, Brian Hall. And that gave me a tremendous amount of optionality and distribution at a time when distribution was really, really important. The other thing that that management team gave me which is a license that I have to this day, and which is probably the most valuable license anyone in my seat will ever have, is a no adverse selection license. And what that means was there was no arbitrary constraints on what we were going to build, right? It would be just as easy for me to engage with a first-time fund who nobody in the world ever heard of in a nation strategy 
or something that was out of favor as it was for me to do the next Blackstone Fund or the next Millennium product. Not that those things aren't extremely valuable on both sides of that ledger, but I had the ability to run the barbell, which meant that the things we knew about controlling classes of CMBS and related types of things, with which wealth management channels, quite frankly, never saw in a discreet way, we were able to offer. And it wasn't like, hey, you know, 37 months is a long enough track record, but 35 isn't, or, you know, you can be 29% of that fund, but not 31, or you can be in fund two, but not in fund one. We took that all out of the equation, and that was the contingency for me to sign up. You know, you had to run an investment-driven process that was 100% outcomes-oriented. There were other ways to do it, and Bob and Brian and I talked a lot about that and said, look, you can go another way and you can build. I'm just not in the business of giving away seven to 10 years of hard work every five years. So I'm just not your guy if that's the way you want to go. Um, and we came to an agreement on, on what my latitude was going to be. And these people have been steadfast in their support of that. So when I got there, I had a regional remit in the Americas. There was seven or eight billion dollars laying around. Um, there probably wasn't a product launched in 12 or 18 months. Today, my remit's global, and we're approaching $100 billion in our all Congratulations. We made some strides. Thank you. So, we made some strides. So, so Jerry, I got to ask you this because uh, you've been around a long time. This is my 32nd year now starting yeah. in the business. And uh, you know, I grew up at Goldman Sachs, very client-driven at that time. The boss said, you know, we're long-term greedy, build the relationships forever. Uh, one of the things that's happened in COVID-19 for me is the awareness of how dramatically Wall Street has changed. It, it yeah. has become very transactional. And so yeah. people you think you have 10, 20, 30 year relationships with, it turns out you actually don't. They, they start ghosting you if you don't do well. And so my yeah. question is, how have you maintained that long term? How has Brian Hall maintained that? How have other people at UBS yeah. maintained that? hallmark of it still being a relationship business yeah well because that's all you got in the end anthony you're going to have your reputation and your relationships and that's all you're going to have um when it's all done and so uh, i live every day like tomorrow's my last day quite frankly but right well me uh, too i mean that's you, how i grew up i mean the I, reality is i, those I get two, that those are the two things you're going to have you know brian always says leaders define cultures cultures define organizations and culture is the best predictor of a company's future that's that's a uh, that's a direct quote of Mr. Hall, who you know I hold in the highest. Say it, say it again slowly, Jeb, because I think it's an awesome quote. I've yeah, heard he him says, say it all the time. He says, "Leaders define cultures, cultures define organizations, and culture is the best predictor of a company's future." And he's right. Nope. And and I think no you question. Know, if the world knows that you're playing the long game all the time, right? Um, then then they know. And that has to happen in actions, not in words. And, and there's times when it matters. So if you can point to the times yeah. when the relationship mattered and you score high there for the right reasons, um, then then that becomes that becomes your legacy. That's what we want ours to be. Not, well, ever, amen. not ever to compromise a client, not ever to compromise a standard, not ever to compromise your reputation, your franchise, your firm. But um, there are just times when um, you got to make intelligent decisions at critical moments, and that's what's going to separate you. I think when 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 the when the last when the last tally gets taken. Oh, listen, you've definitely you've definitely demonstrated that over the course of your career, but particularly now. And so, uh, and frankly, Skybridge has been the beneficiary of that long term relationship. So I want I want to say thank you to that. Specific to the hedge fund industry, the the industry did reasonably well. Uh, after 2008, then, yeah. you know, sort of passive money took over as the Fed started really washing the uh, universe with capital. What do, you, what do you think about today? You know, the hedge fund industry yeah. post COVID-19, is it going to do well? And what sectors will do better than others in your yeah. opinion? Well, I mean, look, I, uh, I, I think we are by and large as an industry doing well. I think, you know, when you run in a book, whether you're an allocator or you're a direct risk taker, you want your big positions to be the ones working and your small positions to be the ones that are. And fortunately, on most of the platforms, not only our own here, but on most, you tend to have bigger positions and things that are that have that have stayed the course and navigated this a little better, like multi-strat. And the places where we're challenged, obviously, in those kind of external leverage dependent um, 
areas of the market where where we had some problems, you tend to have smaller positions because the, the capacity for those things is is oftentimes lower. So you come in okay. Um, I think there are areas where we're going to do very well, be they in downside protection or in dislocation. And I think we're going to get into we're going to get into the strategies in the markets we think are favorable or unfavorable as this whole discussion goes on. But you know, by and large, in those areas, I think I think um, I think we look promising. And more importantly, I think I'm starting to hear a little bit less of the types of narratives that we heard over the last 10 years. Like I can't make enough money after tax. What am I paying the fees for? Fees are X percentage of, you know, total expectancy. I don't understand the value position proposition anymore. You know, we were getting quite a bit of that out of the, out of the wealth community. And I would make a big distinction here. It wasn't necessarily clients. Um, it was equally um, and as much their advice providers that had that position. And, you know, once you start to lose them, when you sit in an intermediary business like ours, you know, it becomes problematic. You really have to be articulate through that. And I, I would say now um, the narrative is a little bit more constructive. March and April were quiet. Um, May, June and July are not. People are actionable and investing. People are revisiting things that they, that they, um, they were looking to leave a long time ago. And performance has been okay, right? Um, and it's been okay in multiple disciplines and strategies. So it feels okay to me um, in places. You know, whether or not, you know, hedged equity is going to generate enough alpha, particularly on the short side, looks promising, yet, you know, TBD. Same thing on, um, same thing on macro, which, you know, the amount of imbalance we've had in the world and all the things that we, we're dealing with that are hard to underwrite, macro should be doing a lot better than it generally tends to do. And that's been and that's been something that's been prevalent for quite some time. But it's a it's a different world. Um, I think it's a different world than it was 10 years ago. I know we're going to talk about that, too, but I think it puts us in fairly good stead. I would expect to see some dispersion in those results, though. So let's talk about that. It is a different world. And so so yeah. what 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 makes it different? You know, it's interesting. I was just on with one of uh, our investors, uh, people who were invested in Dan Loeb at Third Point. Yep. We're yep. talking about the differences. He's going to be speaking next week on Salt Talks. We're talking about the differences between 2008 and yep. March of 2020, where basically the entire global financial yeah. crisis happened in about seven to 15. Yeah, well, days. is that right? Is that obviously the time um, that that we condensed this whole thing in? Um, I think last time you had far less capital, far more time, and therefore you had a tide that would raise all boats. And if you were brave enough. And the tide rose, it was hard to get it wrong. We're harder to get it wrong. I think this time is very different because you're dealing with things you just can't underwrite from a financial perspective. You can't underwrite the healthcare problem. You can't really underwrite the election because no matter where you go there, you, there's a whole set of issues you got to contend with. And you may be looking at a hard pivot from one posture to another. Um, you've got the civil issues that we're all grappling with and reconciling. So you can't throw the financial modeling at that, right? You can't make a reasonable forecast, which means that it's just the tails are fatter and it's hard to be brave. Um, it was also less crowded last time. So so it's a, to me, it's an interesting juxtaposition because some of these opportunity sets have velocity associated with them. But at the same time, I think, and you, you might hear Dan talk about this a little bit, it's going to require some patience and picking through. So on the one hand, you're saying, hey, hurry up, okay? There's been a lot of mean reversion in certain areas of the market already. What's really left, right? Um, and on the other hand, you're saying, be patient, be careful. It's crowded. It's going to be complex. And, you know, whether you're talking about mortgages or corporates, whole loan to corporates versus structured, uh, mortgage, you know, commercial versus resi and property, agency versus non, this onion just has a lot of layers, but and there's a lot of capital chasing it. And, you know, you got a lot of work to do to sift through where the real value is going to be. So I think it's I think it's very I think it's very different um, because there are just there are factors there that we haven't had to contend with in the past where it's been a financial problem. So 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 go so to the structured credit for a second. That was sort of the epicenter yeah. of the crisis in March. Certainly had a big impact on the Skybridge portfolio. Yeah, where what's your view now of structured credit yeah. and uh, uh, where are you guys? 
Yeah. So look, I, you know, this is an interesting one too. And this is where investing gets difficult. Like, you know, you might have a partner that's got some, some legacy issues, but sometimes the challenges are the opportunities as we know, but um, how, how do you make the decision between chasing a fresh pool of capital with no legacy issues that you're going to pay 20% of the profits away to day one versus a portfolio that you couldn't replace at the price it's currently marked at, but there may be some firm issues, enterprise risk issues, reputational issues, or other things, and you got to decide, um, you know, how you're going to deploy that capital. Um, you also, as I just alluded to before, have a tremendous amount of relative value analysis to do, more so than you had to do last time. Between all the different things that I mentioned and all the different degrees of freedom and subclasses that you have to go through. So I think we come away where most people do um, in 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 real estate related structured credit, we think right now relative value is in the residential side. I think commercial real estate is going to be uh, a lot trickier beyond the obvious, um, you know, uh, hospitality, retail and development being challenged and industrial apartments and offices to some extent being better. Um, you know, we all know we all know where the concentration of sector exposure is in the controlling classes of securitizations. And that's just going to take some time. And the fundamentals there are still pretty tough. The housing market's different, right? The housing market's different. It can get, it can garner a lot of support. The consumer being what it is to GDP and housing being what it is to the consumer is going to mean um, that there's going to be a lot more thrust at figuring out a path forward on the resi side. Um, by and large, you know, with corporates, um, you know, similar type of thing, CLO equity is difficult. Um, thing to assess these days. We all see the filings. We all know what's potentially coming, but we don't understand recovery, severities, defaults quite well enough yet. And so corporate side is interesting and you have more support there. So um, absolute but value. You're getting, you're getting paid though, right, Chair? I mean, if you yeah, look at the get, spreads, I, you're getting I, paid for some of this risk, yes? Or? I think you are, but I think when I alluded to velocity before, right, the best opportunity probably has the highest velocity and mean reversion right now, which is RMBS. And the only reason I don't say right. th that RMBS is is clearly um, and by a distance where I would be positioned most favorably, it's because it has that velocity yeah. or decay. If you want to look at it through the other lens, decay of opportunity set associated with it that could increase in velocity versus decay in velocity. I think on the commercial side, if you own it right, you're going to have a tremendous opportunity. Like most of the commercial real estate exposure we have, certainly on the debt side, is in the hands of people that have tremendous toolkits, own servicing, have tremendous workout capabilities, have no leverage, no external dependence, have 10-year locked capital, have returned a multiple of capital already. So like when you have that scenario, right, you have unlevered, unencumbered cash flows with time. That's a whole lot different than trying to pick a spot to enter a drawdown or make a decision whether you're going to stay with someone or move into a fresh pool of capital and start paying away gains. We were fortunate enough to have a very late cycle posture coming into this. So we had things we were already doing, not in anticipation of this, but a late cycle posture. So we have, we have some pools that we think are structured right. They have the right amount of time associated with them. They're not for sellers. So they can play some offense, right? And so I think I know we we're, I mean we're in total agreement. I mean that's one commercial of the, the real benefits estate from of that perspective. Very mm -hmm. interesting. You know, look, oh, our our whole platform, you know, if we just move away from structured credit a little bit, just by and large, I'm offering first loss risk in the places that I think are more resilient sector wise, right? So maybe that's healthcare or tech or TMT. And you know, there's no reason to take first loss risk in wobbly sectors like property and energy and retail, because you have the credit markets, you can take a senior position. And to your point, you can get paid fairly, fairly well for the risk you're taking. Why run to the first loss position there at this point? Later on, when it's time to rescue, when it's time to rescue and refi and deal with loan to own and non-performing, we'll get there. But that's a different kettle of fish, different skill set. That's why the hedge fund business is so relevant in this whole exercise right now, because it's still a top of the stack securities driven for seller type of opportunity set. The question is understanding whether or not you have to rush. Well, we, we, we totally agree. And I think that's one of the things that we've been benefiting from why we, we had our best asset fundraising in the month of June, because 
you're feeding into funds that are not going to participate in forward profits for a period of time. And yet you've got very right. well-priced assets with high yields. Yeah. I got to turn it. I, it's amazing. Sorry, I'm sorry. I'll, I'll wrap up this one, but it's, it's amazing how the market doesn't respect that enough. Right. And that's because it's an emotional time and people are dealing with a lot of stuff in their businesses and in the health of their families and in trying to work from home. And even in a normal market, you know, investors don't tend to get that discipline. Right. And in, in this world where it's a real hard world, it's even harder. Well, I know I appreciate it, but I, I appreciate you guys seeing that and seeing that as an opportunity in yeah. us. I've got I got to turn it over to John Darcy because we have a tremendous amount of participation right now. We've got uh, questions coming in to Mr. Darcy. So go ahead, John. Okay. Yeah, and just a reminder to everyone watching, if you have any questions for Jerry, you can enter them in the Q&A box at the bottom of your video screen. And uh, as long as they're in bounds, we'll, we'll ask them and, and you'll get your answer. So the first question is about when you're evaluating hedge fund managers, you know, personal characteristics and organizational characteristics, what are some things that you look for when yeah. you're evaluating hedge funds for your platform? So, I mean, look, everybody's got the obvious stuff around performance at critical moments and all that stuff. For me, like, it's culture number one. We talked about that. I got to recognize what your culture is and you got to be playing the same long game that I'm playing. Character, obviously. And character can mean a lot of things. Transparency, I guess I would put in that category you know, lack of surprises, talent, obviously, and intellectual capital, you know, your ability to attract and retain talent um, is going to give you the durability that I want you to have over the long run. Um, and, you know, first and foremost, as I said before, as an investor, it's it's outcomes. It's, it's not, hey, you can gather a lot of assets, therefore you're a priority. Never been my game. Um, I'd rather generate a great outcome on a small amount of assets than a bad outcome on a large amount of assets. Um, so, all the risk taking stuff that you would expect comes into play here. But I think culturally, because of my background and because I spent the earlier part of my career doing two things, right? I was a middle market lender, which interestingly enough has moved out of the conventional financial system into the alternative world that I now live in. And I was an allocator. Those are the two things that informed me, you know, and I think people don't understand how hard it is to liquidate collateral. People don't understand how hard it is to turn things off, even things that are systematic, right? You got to kick the plug out sometimes. Very, very hard decision. So, you know, I think there are elements of risk taking that we look for um, that come from having a career building an investment process as opposed to having a career structuring um, or selling, right, if you will. So that's what's really going to inform what we're looking for at a high at a higher level going in. And the reason is because, you know, People I compete with might do 70, 80 products in a given year for a wealth channel. I'll do 20, which means every mistake I make is glaring. Every success I have is glaring. I like it that way, right? Um, because the value that um, that we generate is becomes obvious and it distinguishes our business. Um, but, you know, unless you have an investment background, it's a tough way to live your life. Uh, and so we, we look for people because we're going to have fewer partners and because we're going to apply selectivity to the exercise, I got to believe that, you know, we're, we're going to, we're going to be dancing for a very long time. Um, so that has to factor in early. And even if we think you're great for the moment, if, if, if you can't be transparent, we're not going to communicate. I don't respect your culture. You know, you're transactional. You're looking to give me a deal. Uh, you're looking to you're looking to redline every word of every document I show you. You're not long term outcomes oriented. Um, I kind of go away fast. The conversation so far has revolved main, mainly around hedge funds and real estate back structured credit, but you cover the entire alternative investment ecosystem. Yeah. Yeah. So private equity was sort of the hot dot for the last yeah. several years leading into the pandemic. Yeah. And we've talked to several you know, distressed uh, credit investors and others on Salt Talks that have expressed some you know, worries about once the sort of uh, Federal Reserve and government support uh, runs out maybe in the fall, what the private equity space is going to look like. Could you talk yeah. a little bit about concerns and opportunities you see in, in the private yeah. equity uh, space? Yeah, look, I, I'm not a huge believer in the, you know, there's going to be a distraction and good money's going to get thrown after bad and they're not going to be able to find the cheapness because they're working out this or that. Look, I, I think it's foolish to think that if, if these businesses were run on a mark-to-market basis, they wouldn't show 
um, they wouldn't show some wear and some pressure and some stress in some places. I think that'd be foolish to think. But um, but they don't. They have the benefit of the structural advantages that that they carry. Um, and as we've seen in the past on many, many marquee transactions, uh, with time and real operational capability and some help from the system uh, and stimulus and or rescue or whatever you want to call it, you know, you can turn situations that look pretty grim into situations that turn out pretty, pretty well. So um, it's going to be a very interesting vintage. We've been saying for years, right, before this came, we're either going to get a break in the world late in the investment, in, in late in the investment cycle of this vintage, and we're going to have overpaid for a lot, or we're going to get a break early in the vintage, and we're going to find some unbelievable cheapness. And so it's not going to be an average vintage, no matter how you cut it. And I think that's probably still true. Um, so TBD there. Um, again, I think you're going to start to see dispersion. It's not really an engineering game as much as it is in a, you know, straight up, you know, bottom left to top right bull market. Those who really have the operational capability that everyone claims to have are, are going to fare through this a lot better. Um, e even if they, even if they wind up having made some of the mistakes that others did going in, um, you know, how you manage through this is going to be interesting. And let's not forget, you know, Secondary market is a lot more developed than it was. The co-investment business is a lot more developed than it was. Um, sometimes I worry about, you know, you know, in private equity, everyone's kind of all over each other's cap stack, if you will. Um, and I sometimes wonder what happens when a bunch of really shrewd investors who are all over the capital stack of each other's companies kind of get in, get into some friction. And I think we haven't seen that um, and we're going to. And I think that's going to be an interesting part of this cycle um, for sure. We have I hope that questions. answers your question. Yeah, no, that's great. Uh, we have two questions that are somewhat similar in nature, and, and I'll sort of combine them into one. You know, And we deal with this at Skybridge as well on a philosophical basis. But how do you combat the IBM problem? So, you know, it's safer for an analyst to put forward an established manager that has a, a big brand name versus looking for emerging managers with a new strategy that might be interesting uh, but but maybe take some time to establish itself or perform yeah. well. So two ways. What I said to you before, this squarely falls into that category. If you're if you're not constrained in terms of how, if you don't have the license to think, you can't avoid the problem you just described, right? So the first thing you had to do was have the license to engage in that smaller manager and decide what you were going to believe and whether or not you could articulate that belief. That's step number one. Unless you structurally possess the license. I don't care who you are. You just can't do what you want to do. The second thing is it's just got to be in the DNA of the process you run. Not once in a while, not only when the world breaks, but it's got to be in your DNA. Your, your, your investment team has to be able to source. It has to be able to test its hypotheses. It has to be able to make mistakes, right? If it can't do those things, it can't learn how to have the appropriate discipline to invest earlier or smaller, right? And, you know, I think you're right. Um, why in the world, in an environment like we're in today, would you want to take on any, say, enterprise risk, right? Those are tougher things to price when you have uncertainty everywhere else. But when you don't, right, you, have, you, might, you might pivot your tolerances a little bit, right? One of the best relationships um, I have in my business today and one of the best investment entry points I ever had was in the CMBS B pieces in late 2010, early 2011 with a partner called Rialto. Um, and those, some of you on the call might know them, others can check out who they are. But at the time we engaged in that partnership, there wasn't a person on earth outside of the actual um, commercial real estate business that knew who these people were because they never had um, an asset management entity, if you will, or a sponsor entity, if you will. We've invested with that group over every point in the cycle, trough, recovery, peak, and now again. And they've proven to have the type of skill set that's durable enough to take you through um, each time you take a bite. But um, without that willingness to be in a first close and a first time fund at a time when everyone was still consumed by residential real estate problems, and not even thinking about commercial with a sponsor no one ever heard of, 
It was the second product I ever put on the UBS platform. And I, I can tell you how many phone calls I got like, hey, dopey, you work at a bank. Did anybody <laughs> tell you that? Or you work at a Swiss bank, uh, in case you haven't noticed. Or, you know, what, what are you thinking? And, you know, we just said to ourselves, look, we're here to handicap all these exposures and opportunity sets, ex ante, forward looking. And this is something that I took from the, you know, Skybridge, City, Solomon DNA that we built, right? That's our job. Handicap the opportunity set, get the best possible expression, be really communicable about the outcomes you think you could generate, all the possible outcomes, and never look back several years later not knowing why you did what you did, when you did it, and with whom you partnered. And so if you can instill that in your process, you can invest it in those areas. You can't do them for a living every day. You have to be balanced commercially. They're not even suitable for a good portion of our investor base. But to whom they are, we owe that to them. It's well said. At the end of the day, you're serving the customer. I mean, that's, that's what right. all we've tried to do with Skybridge is be a fiduciary, but also uh, provide an investment opportunity that people would look at over a long period of time, not measured by a month. You know, Jerry, uh, I met you on July 1. It's 2010. It's July 4th, 13th of 2020. Ten years later, Troy, Ray, and I had a good 120 months. We had, uh, I'm so, sorry, a good 119 months. We had one bad month. I mean, it's sort of nuts. But uh, anyway, look, I'm, ben, at, I'm ventilating. Look, Piscucci, you're cheaper than my therapist, so I'm ventilating. You, you got okay? to look at the way. Thank you. You got to look at the way that risk is assembled. And if that risk was assembled in a sound fashion, and you had a you had a clientele that understood the risk they embarked on, and were realistic about what you know the lost possibilities and probabilities could be in something as extreme as we've seen. Um, I think you owe that at least some consideration, as opposed to a knee jerk reaction, is what I'll say. Yeah. So on our, on our next episode of Jerry and Anthony, I'll ask you why <laughs> some wirehouses sell at the bottom. But since that's not politically correct. We're going to turn it back over to John for more questions. Go ahead, John. Don't answer, Jerry. Don't answer. No, no, ahead, John. no. <laughs> so, so, Jerry, you talked a little bit about process, and uh, we had a follow-up question about, you know, your ability to judge a manager as character with face-to-face -face meetings, but in an environment where, you know, you're working from home yeah. and you have a global pandemic and you can't conduct due diligence in the same yeah. way that you typically would. How yeah. has that affected your process uh, you know, not being able to be in the same room with prospective new managers and evaluating decisions on existing managers on your platform. Yeah, I won't kid you. It, it is it is limiting. Um, you know, like I said, I, we do less. So there are fewer people we're going to get to that point with anyway. But um, it is limiting. You know, you, you can't. Um, it, it's hard to understand body language. You know, I got invited by someone in the industry to listen to Molly Bloom speak. You know, and I wasn't able to make it to that particular session, but it was one of these things like, hey, why don't you come to this session and think of a question for Molly? And what I would have said to Molly was, you know, your game is a game of tells. And how do you how do you see tells virtually? Right. When you got someone from the neck up and you have no idea what they're looking down at. And it's I think the answer is it's really hard. Um, so I think what you have to do there is, you know, your referencing's got to get deeper and wider and more off the run. And you got to spend more time, you know, digging through some of that stuff that you, you know, if someone's in a room with you, it makes you comfortable. You know, it does put your guard down a little bit. Maybe you would have only done six references instead of eight or eight instead of 10. Or um, maybe you would have said to yourself, yeah, those references are good enough. But I think in this environment, you know, you need to risk mitigate the fact that you only have a person from the neck up and you have no idea who else is in the room. And it's there's no there's no there's no real, you know, panacea for that. I think it's something we're all trying to contend with. And therefore, um, this default to safer pairs of hands, low enterprise risk, longer track records, that trend is going to be very intact for the reason you you, you just um, brought up. Um, and. You know, it borders on asking yourself whether you're acting responsibly. If you if you if you decide to go forward with a partnership that you don't feel fully comfortable in vetting, so I do think it's limiting, and that's what's causing some of the ever more concentrating trends in the asset bases, for sure. 
So we'll ask you one more question before we let you go. And it sort of goes back to a question that Anthony asked earlier, but the hedge fund industry in general was you know, reputationally somewhat uh, down in the years leading up to the pandemic due to performance and, and due to you know, the outperformance of equity markets, which have now rallied back to near all time highs. And some in the case yeah. of some indexes back to uh, greater than all time highs, previous all time highs. But uh, in the post COVID environment, uh, what do you see as the outlook for the hedge fund industry uh, in general? Um, look, I mean, I'm always uncomfortable when the first loss is telling you everything's fine and the last loss is telling you everything's not. I think, I think life works better when it's happening the other way. It's kind of more natural. Um, so, you know, I don't, I can't claim to understand, you know, why the stock market seems to predict that, you know, we don't really have any issues and the ones that we do have, we can understand, digest and are all hundred percent transitory. I, you know, as a career alternative investor, I, you know, we tend to be perma bearish. We tend to have value biases. It's a hard pill to swallow. Um, that being said, you know, the Fed's going to support risk assets, and and there's all kinds of other other structural um, factors that create uh, a very bullish sentiment. And of course, you do have the winners in this new economy. Um, and so, I could tell you two things, right? That in my mind, the uncertainty is higher, which means the tails are fatter, which means hedge funds have a better chance. Just, just like death and taxes for me, right? Um, because it's hard to, to come up with a null hypothesis that says the world is not riskier tomorrow than it was yesterday. And uh, at least for a while. And however that winds up, okay, there's so many pathways that lead to so many things that could be so destructive to an economy and a society be they inflationary or deflationary, um, that it should provide a pretty fertile um, environment for trading oriented strategies. It should it should provide a good environment for alpha shorting. It should provide a good uh, environment for both bottoms up and top down hedging. Um, all the things that we have in our toolkit as a as an investing community to put to work. And I know it's been a long time. It was a long grind up. Um, and, uh, you know, for the equity markets and a pretty long grind out of favor for the hedge fund community. But I think there are bright spots. and I think our opportunity set has to be better um, as a function of all this. And the volatility, when you have things that you can't underwrite financially, like we talked about before, has got to be prevalent. And so I think structurally we have the environment um, that we need to have, dispersion, volatility, Shorting, risk mitigation, leverage will be important at the right times, dislocation, complexity, distress, regulatory evolution. I mean, there's nothing that we need that we don't have. Well, we agree. And Jerry, thanks so much for joining us. Anthony, I want to let you have the final word before we uh, before we read the end of the segment here. No, I, I think Jerry captured it well. I mean, it's a uh know each other a long time. I, what I love about you, Jerry, is that you combine a total academic understanding of what's going on with a lot of commercial instincts. And so hopefully uh, we'll get this out to as many people as possible because there's a lot to be learned in terms of the long-term wisdom that you're sharing with everybody. So thank you, Jerry. And uh, John. Yeah, the, we, we have- uh... the, the, when the When the salt <laughs> talk is over, Pascucci and I are going to have a conversation with you about the porch you're behind. We're definitely going to make, do that. I'll still yeah, 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 try. I'll no, keep trying. No, no question. I've, I've I, tried I've to find a background to, that makes you happy. I've, but I've already sent it to a lot of our Salt Talk fans <laughs> who are, you know, just silent. There's just silence, John. So, go ahead. You have the final word. All right, let, go ahead, let me, Say let, what you want to say, Jerry, because it's it's horrifying. <laughs> Yeah, well, we'll get to we'll get to Georgia in a minute. Like I said, you know, I th I think it's a period of time when we got to celebrate what this nation's about. So I'll tolerate I'll tolerate George for the moment, or whoever that not George Washington. Guy is. It's, it's yeah. not George or, or whoever that French guy is or English guy you got back. No there. idea. Um, look, I, I just want to say thanks. This is a great opportunity for us to share some of the the features of our business that we find or think or hope to be distinguishing. I thank you, Anthony, for your for your partnership over the years. We have known each other for a long time. Um, I'm flattered that you would include me in something like this. As I said before, I kind of I look at the screen at all these very distinguished people who have accomplished so much in their professions. 
um, and in their lives. And it's humbling to to uh, to have to have my very repulsive face in a box. Hey, next man, to you're people. you're but you know, don't yeah. kid yourself. You're an industry expert at a time <laughs> where the expertise is super valuable. And at the end of the day, our conference is really hubbed around the main arteries of what you do for a living. So we're, but, we're thrilled to have you on. But thank Glad you. I'm, you accepted very, the I'm invitation. very grateful. It was fun. I hope we get to do it again. And I, I hope some people find it useful, but it was terrific being with you. Same, same here. Thanks, John. I yeah, like thank, you. Thanks, Jerry. Yeah. Somebody in the <laughs> chat, in the chat on the, uh, in the zoom, uh, webinar basically said I was inspired by watching Hamilton on Disney plus. So yeah. Is that, we'll is that, that. Is that stag you got back there? Your Patronus? What's going on over there? Exactly. You know, I, I brought some uh, science fiction into it too. Oh, oh my God.